welcome to Rooted Fellowship Digital. Uh, we're glad that you have tuned in with us um, and you consider us a safe space uh, as we journey uh, to seek to understand who Jesus is and what that means for our lives. Now, we have been in the book of Mark for a very long time, uh, over a year and a half, uh, and it's been incredible, absolutely incredible, but we uh, are closing the chapter now. We're closing the book. Uh, we're shutting it down. Um, and, uh, and I'm excited about what God is going to do over these next two Sundays. And so the plan originally was to uh, preach uh, the end of Mark in one sermon. Uh, but there's so much good stuff here. And so I don't want to rush it. Uh, we don't need to rush it. Um, and so we're going to break it up into two sermons. And so this is part one of the end of the gospel according to Mark. Now, if you are really tuning in, uh, you would probably uh, be asking the question, Oney, what about Mark chapter 14 and 15? Uh, what happened to them? Uh, we have not skipped them. Uh, if you are part of a city group, you would remember uh, that uh, over the course of Holy Week, uh, we took some time to read through those chapters, to, in a sense, uh, walk with Jesus over the, his last few days. And we see that in Mark 14 and 15. And so we didn't preach them, but we did read through them in community as we reflected on what Jesus has accomplished. Now, at some point, we'll probably come back to those two chapters and preach them verse by verse. Uh, it might be next year, it might be the year after, who knows. Uh, but I know that we uh, have learned so much uh, through this season. Uh, and so uh, we're super, super excited uh, for you to be a part of what God is doing, and, uh, and my hope is that uh, you would be connected if you are not. Uh, and so if anything has stood out for you uh, in this message that you're about to hear, uh, we ask that you reach out to us at community at roosterfellowship.com. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we'd love to get you connected if you are not connected. Uh, and as always, our hope is that we would see you face to face uh, one day. Uh, and so we pray for that as we long for it, uh, ready and expectant for God to work. Enjoy this message. Hello everyone, um, welcome to part one of our finale of the Gospel according to Mark. Um, it's crazy to think that we have been in this book uh, for just over a year and a half uh, and it's been an amazing journey but we are coming to an end. I was actually planning on wrapping it up uh, today but uh, as I continue to study the text uh, and make my way through it, I realized uh, that there's so much goodness here, and so we'd have to uh, make it a two-part series. Uh, and so this is part one. Uh, and my hope is that you would see why uh, as we make our way through it, uh, and it would be uh, ever so clear at the end, uh, and that you would uh, look forward to next week uh, as we dive into part two of the same text in, uh, in many ways. Um, and so we're in Mark chapter 16, uh, we're going to be looking at verse 9 to 20. Now, uh, if you really have been following with us, uh, you'd be able uh, to see and, and you should ask the question, hey, uh, on a, what about Mark chapter 14 and 15? Uh, what happened to those chapters? Uh, we're not skipping them. Uh, we, uh, we took some time over Easter to read them together as uh, as a community in our city groups. And so if you're part of our city groups, uh, then you would have navigated through those two chapters, uh, looking at the final days of Jesus uh, and doing so in community, reflecting uh, in community over all that Jesus has done. Um, and so we're not preaching them verse by verse uh, on a Sunday like, uh, like this, but, uh, but rather we're going to kind of skip ahead and go to the end of the chapter. And who knows, maybe one day we'll come back uh, and literally go verse by verse, um, uh, maybe over Easter next year or the year after. Uh, let's see what uh, God will do. But today we're in Mark chapter 16, uh, verses uh, 9 to 20. Now, if you have a Bible uh, and you look uh, at verse 9, in fact, if you go a little bit above verse 9, uh, your Bible might say something like this. Some of the earliest uh, manuscripts conclude with verse uh, chapter 16, verse 8, uh, something of, uh, of that variation, basically communicating to you uh, that, hey, uh, Mark ch chapter 16 ends at verse 8. 
Um, and so this begs the question, well, why do we have 9 to 20? Um, and so I'm going to try to answer that uh, today, and if I don't, then I'll definitely get to it next week. Um, but let me read it. All right, let me start by reading Mark chapter 16 from verse 9 all the way to verse 20, uh, and then we'll jump in. All right, so hear these words of our Father. Early on the first day of the week, after he had risen, this is speaking of Jesus, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him as they were mourning and weeping. Yet when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe it. After this, he appeared in a different form to two of them walking on their way into the country. And they went and reported it to the rest, who did not believe them either. Later, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table. He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who saw him after he had risen. Then he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes. If you're wondering where uh, the snake ministry comes from, uh, maybe it's here. Who knows? Um, if they should drink anything deadly, it will not harm them. And they will lay hands on the sick and they will get well. So the Lord Jesus, after speaking to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the accompanying signs. Now, like I said, there's some questions around whether Mark wrote verses 9 to 20. Right? There's, a, there's a lot of questions. If you do a little bit of reading, um, you look at uh, theologians and, and, and those who've gone before us, there are some questions around whether Mark wrote this with an overwhelming majority saying he didn't. All right? Mark did not write verses 9 to 20, which has brought the question, can we consider these words as the word of God? And I, th I think that's a fair question to ask. Remember, uh, again, if you look in your Bible, uh, mine says some of the earliest manuscripts conclude with verse 8. And so what does that mean for verses 9 to 20? Right? Was it Mark who wrote it? If it wasn't, then who did? And is it the word of God? Can we consider it the very word of God? Now look, I, I'm with the majority on the first question. Right? I'm with the majority. I don't believe Mark wrote uh, this portion of chapter 16. However, I am still convinced that this is the very word of God. And it doesn't make me wonder if the word uh, as a whole is reliable. Uh, it doesn't uh, leave me doubting. I still believe, as Paul uh, wrote in 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scripture, that's what he says, he says all scripture, and so I consider verses 9 to 20 as part of all scripture. So he says all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. And so that is why I believe verses 9 to 20 are the word of God, even though they have not been written by Mark. Now, uh, let me give you some evidence uh, that points to the fact that Mark did not write these verses. I, I don't want you just to go, okay, uh, on there, just because you said it, now we must believe it. No. Uh, let me give you some evidence. Uh, and I want to give you both inward and outward evidence to prove to us that Mark did not write these verses. When I say inward, it's evidence that is in the text itself, uh, and then outward, it's evidence uh, that comes from other people. All right, so let's start with inward. Remember, this is evidence to prove that Mark did not write this. The gr grammatical structure and style in verses 9 to 20 is very different from the rest of the book of Mark. 
very, very, very different, suggesting that there was a different writer, right? Now, I don't want to get in uh, to the whole syntax and uh, the way uh, gender works in the Greek language, uh, and I'm talking about the gender of words, uh, not the gender of people. Um, I, literally, I don't want to get into all the hermeneutics, and uh, let me not bore you with that, but let me do tell you that the grammatical structure and style is very different. It's quite a change from verse 8 to verse 9. That's reason number one. Reason number two, again, from the text, is that there are 18 words that are used in, in verses 9 to 20 that don't appear anywhere else in the rest of the book of Mark. Now, if there were three or four, I'd be like, okay, that's not enough uh, for, for us to say, you know, there's a different writer here. But 18, 18 words in, in these verses that don't appear anywhere else in the book of Mark. That's interesting. Another reason is the phrase, the Lord Jesus, uh, that we see uh, in verse 19, the Lord Jesus, is not used anywhere else in the rest of the book of Mark. It's a new phrase. It's almost like uh, if it was the same author, he's got, no, he's got different titles for Jesus, and then all of a sudden decides on this one, that's like, well, wh where did this one come from? In fact, if we are to look at the rest of Scripture, the Lord Jesus is a title that was used long after Jesus had ascended to heaven. And so again, this suggests to us that it's a different writer. And then lastly, uh, the way that Mary Magdalene is introduced here is somewhat strange. It's as if the writer is introducing Mary to us for the very first time. Like we have no idea who she is, but then why are you doing that at the end? Actually, we do know who Mary is. We've heard of her before, right? So he introduces her in this new way that's like, okay, this is a different writer, all right? So that's just uh, some evidence pointing uh, to the fact that this is a different writer, and this is all from the text. But now let me give you some outward evidence from outside the text proving a different writer. As your Bible probably says at the end of verse 8, the early manuscripts of Mark did not have verses 9 to 10. They didn't. The early manuscripts did not have verses 9 to 20. They ended at verse 8. Uh, it's important to note that including uh, the, the recent development in church history. It's something that they realized in, in the early church and in early church history. Uh, Christians have known for centuries that Mark Chapter 16, verses 9 to 20, might not have been originally written by Mark himself. It's not a new thing. It's not like we've stumbled upon it in the last 20, 50, 100 years. No, this has been in the church history for years. So it's not like we've been caught out. They've been communicating this for years. There are effectively just two Greek manuscripts that lack Mark chapter 16, verses 9 to 20. It's only two. Uh, they're important. They're important manuscripts. But there's only two. If, if we look at all the other manuscripts, and some say that there's about uh, 1,600 manuscripts out there. Just remember how they would have to copy back in the day. They didn't have a photocopying machine. Literally, the scribes would take the manuscript and copy everything. And there's only two that don't have verses 9 to 20. While there are thousands that do, but still, we want to be honest. We want to be honest and say it does not appear in the early manuscripts. And so that means that 99% of the old manuscripts do have verses 9 to 20. But there's enough consensus to say, hey, hold on. Uh, yes, Mark didn't write this, but we believe this to still be a part of the word of God. And so this is one of the reasons that I therefore consider these verses to be part of Mark and then also to be part of the Bible. Being clear that Mark did not write them, but they are part of all scripture being inspired by God. That's one reason, just that there's so many manuscripts that have it. Another reason 
is that many of our reputable church fathers have quoted verses 9 to 20. Those that we trust, those who've gone before us, those have, have written uh, uh, great commentaries over the years. We find them quoting verses 9 to 20. In fact, around AD 180, Irenaeus uh, quoted verse 19 as a defense to the gospel. Now, you might go, uh, who is that? Well, if you know the Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius, then you should definitely know the great bishop, Irenaeus. Uh, he was around the same town and did some incredible things in the context of the church. And we find him quoting verse 19 of Mark chapter 16. And so that's another reason that I believe that these verses are part of the word of God. And having said that, uh, let me give you the biggest reason why I believe these verses are the word of God. And that is because I believe in an all-powerful God. I do. I am convinced that God is seated on his throne and that he is fully in control. I believe in a God who is sovereign. He's sovereign enough to keep what he doesn't want in the Bible out. And he is sovereign enough to keep what he wants in the Bible in regardless of the fact that, that the, the scriptures have been written by various people throughout various generations in various cultures. And these people are sinful and imperfect like you and me, and yet God is still sovereign over that. And so if it's in the Bible, I believe it's supposed to be there because God wanted it there. I mean, if God can speak through a donkey, and if God can part the Red Sea, and if God can raise the dead to life, I'm pretty sure if he didn't want verses 9 to 20 in the Bible, they wouldn't be there. But they are. And so we must take them as part of God's word. And so I believe that Mark verses 9 to 20 of chapter 16 are very much part of the canon of scripture. But like I said, we must be honest. I don't believe that Mark wrote it. So, this begs the question, what happened to Mark's ending? Uh, we're going to read here in a moment. Mark ends in a strange way. And so it leaves us wondering, okay, fine, if Mark didn't write that, then, then where is his ending? Because this is weird. To, to end the way he ends in verse 8 is, is somewhat strange. And so, so where is it? Uh, did Mark's ending get lost somewhere? Some are of that opinion. That Mark's ending might have been torn off while they were transporting the manuscript. I don't believe that that's the case. I, I really don't. I believe Mark ended his gospel account of Jesus and his ministry at verse 8. I, I believe that that ending is intentional by Mark. Uh, now let's take a look. Uh, but in order to do so, let me start at Mark chapter 16 from verse 1. All right, so let's start where the chapter begins. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they could go and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb at sunrise. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb for us? Looking up, they noticed that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. They were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he told them. You're, you are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the, the place where they put him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. Now look at verse 8 where Mark ends his chapter. They went out and ran from the tomb because trembling and astonishment overwhelmed them. And they said nothing to anyone since they were afraid. End the book. It seems strange. I'll be honest with you. It's, it seems strange. At first glance, it's like, uh, I've read the other Gospels. Mark, where's the rest of it? 
When we compare this ending to Matthew, Luke, and John, it's strange. But if we compare the way Mark ends his gospel with the rest of Mark, with all that we have seen in the last year and a bit, we will quickly see that Mark doesn't end his gospel account of Jesus in a strange way. To the contrary, he ends it in the same way he's been telling the story of Jesus and his works. If we look closely, we'll see it. There's nothing strange about the way Mark ends here. If he was here today, I think he would say, strange? I've been telling you the story this way. How have you missed this? He ends this book with awe and wonder in the person and the power of Jesus Christ. That's how Mark ends his gospel account of Jesus. He, he wants us to be in awe and wonder of the person and the power of Jesus Christ. S stay with me, stay with me. Let's look at verse 8. Uh, let's look at it again. It says, They went out and ran from the tomb because trembling and astonishment overwhelmed them and they said nothing to anyone since they were afraid. Uh, the New Living Translation says it this way. The women fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered. And they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. The English Standard Version says it this way. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Mark ends his account of Jesus by saying the people, and here it's the women, the first eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection. I just want to point that out. It was women. He ends this account of Jesus by saying that the people were left in astonishment and amazement. That's what he tells us. That they were astonished and amazed. They were also trembling and afraid. Right? So, astonished and amazed, and also trembling and afraid. Now, the word trembling in the Greek is tromos, which means to shake and quiver. Uh, that's a, a physical body movement, right? So, 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 you're astonished and amazed, but you are also shaking. You are bewildered. Uh, the word afraid in the Greek is phobeo, which means to become frightened, to be struck with amazement, to have reverence. That's what it means. And so simply put, they were in awe and wonder of what had just happened. They were in awe and wonder of what had just happened. And this seems to be the normal response to Jesus. A heart that is open to Jesus and his works is often left in astonishment and amazement, trembling and afraid in awe and wonder. To have a real encounter with Jesus. That is how you are left. This ending, according to Mark, is how Mark starts the gospel narrative. And it's how he tells the entire book. Mark is consistently left in awe and wonder. People who have an encounter with Jesus are left in awe and wonder. And so it makes sense that he ends his gospel account by saying, Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, people were left in awe and wonder. But let me show you. Let's walk through the book of Mark. We, we won't take as long as we have. Um, it won't be a year and a half. I'm going to walk through it very quickly because I want to show you that, that it's not strange the way Mark ends this book. It's consistent in the telling of Jesus and his works. And so let's take this journey together. Right out the gates, right out the gates, chapter 1, Jesus gets baptized. He announces his ministry to the world, chooses his disciples, and then starts teaching and driving out unclean spirits. Mark wastes no time. You go read the other gospel accounts. Go read Matthew and Luke and John. There's this beautiful introduction. This is who Jesus is, and here's where he comes from. Mark's like, nope, we don't have time for that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump straight into the action. Jesus is teaching, driving out unclean spirits. And so Mark chapter 1, verses 
uh, 22. He's at uh, Carpanium after teaching in the synagogue. Verse 22 says, The people were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of the religious law. Same chapter after casting out a, a demon, verse 27, amazement gripped the audience and they began to discuss what had happened. What sort of new teaching is this? They asked excitedly. It has such authority. Even evil spirits obey his orders. Uh, chapter 2, verse 12, after healing the paralyzed man, uh, it says immediately he got up, took the mat, and went out in front of everyone. As a result, they were all astounded and gave glory to God, saying, we have never seen anything like Mark chapter 4, verse 41, Jesus calms the storm. Uh, remember, Jesus was sleeping. The disciples wake him up and ask him, uh, don't you care that we're going to drown? Uh, remember that? I can't remember who preached it. Uh, maybe Sitle, maybe me. It's been a year and a half. Look at verse 41 of chapter 4. The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and waves obey him. Chapter 5, verse 15. Jesus heals a man who had been possessed by a legion of demons. It says, and they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there, clothed in his right mind. This is after Jesus had healed him. And then we're told they were afraid. Same chapter, verses 33 to 34, the woman uh, who had been bleeding for 12 years. This is one of my favorite uh, Jesus moments. I, I absolutely love this part of scripture. Verse 33, the woman with fear and trembling, we're told, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Look at what an encounter with Jesus does. The whole truth. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be healed from your affliction. Verse 42, this is the resurrection of Jairus' 12-year-old daughter, the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, and Jairus' 12-year-old daughter. These stories are connected. I don't have time to explain it, but uh, go back to the sermon that we preached. It's amazing. And so Jesus resurrects her, and, and we're told that the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up, and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Mark chapter 6, Jesus walks on water. The story starts by him on dry land, and he sees his disciples in the water. There is a storm. He can see them struggling, and so he walks to them on the water. He gets in the boat, and then he calms the storm. I would have loved to see this. Jesus just casually walking on the water. The guys are panicking. He's like, let me get in. All right, stop. Verse 41 tells us, then he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased. They were completely astounded. Let's jump to Mark chapter 9, to the transfiguration. We're told that Peter, James, and John, they see this, and we're told that they were all terrified. They couldn't believe it. Verses 14 and 15 of chapter 9. Uh, let me read this to you. When they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them, and some teachers of the religious law were arguing with them. When the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe, and they ran to greet him. I mean, news of Jesus had been going around, and they were like, we just can't wait to see him. Verses 31 and 32, Jesus predicting his death and resurrection. He says, for he was teaching his disciples and telling them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after he's killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand the statement, and they were too afraid to ask him. Chapter 10, verse 24, Jesus teaching about possessions and the kingdom. 
We're told that the disciples were astonished at his words. Chapter 11, verse 18, after Jesus protests and clears the temple. Verse 18, when the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning to, on how to kill him. But they were afraid of him because the people were so amazed at his teaching. Chapter 12, verse 14, verse 17, sorry. Jesus says one of the best lines ever when he's being challenged about taxes. Who are we supposed to pay taxes? To Caesar? To like what's going on here, Jesus? What are we, what are we to do? They're trying to trick him. And notice his response, verse 17. Well then, Jesus said, Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. And then Mark tells us here, his reply completely amazed them. Mark chapter 15, verse 5. Uh, this is Jesus' engagement uh, with Pilate. He's talking to Pilate here. And we're told, but Jesus still, not, just still did not answer. Right? So Pilate's interacting with him. And Jesus still did not answer. And so Pilate was amazed. And then finally, our text for today, Mark 16, verse 8. They went out and they ran from the tomb because trembling and astonishment overwhelmed them. And they said nothing to anyone since they were afraid. Mark 16, verse 8 is consistent with the rest of the gospel according to Mark. Those who have an encounter with Jesus are left in awe and wonder. And that awe and wonder is clothed in reverence. It's clothed in respect to stand before the Son of God. Awe and wonder. Time and time again. See, I believe Mark ended at verse 8. That there is no lost ending to his book that this is his ending, pointing us to the wonder of Jesus, to the wonder of Jesus in his teaching, to the wonder of Jesus in his miracles, to the wonder of Jesus in his love and care, to the wonder of Jesus in his rebuking and correcting, and now to the wonder of Jesus in his resurrection, affirming that he truly is the Son of God. That's how Mark wants to leave us. Amazement at the Lord Jesus seems to be the theme of Mark. And so now the question that I want to put to you is, are you amazed? Clearly Mark is. He's telling us of accounts of those who've interacted with Jesus and they are left amazed. And so now the question is, are you are you amazed? Or have you become so casual and comfortable with the gospel that it's, it's nothing amazing anymore? That you hear this and your heart goes, yeah, 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 oh, no, I, I know all that. That now uh, that has become the mantra of your heart. Has the gospel of Jesus Christ become stale in your life? And, and you, you may not say it. You may not say it, but it's, it's evident. It's evident in your life. The way that you live your life, you have now become too cool for the gospel. And your life communicates it loud and clear. Jesus and his saving grace are not your new iPhone or, or, or the new car that you just bought. It's not that thing that we love in the beginning. We treat it like gold in the beginning, but then over time it's just, yeah, old news. I think of my MacBook Air. I have confessed many times that I am part of the cult called Apple. Uh, and even though our great leader has died, uh, we uh, still remember him. He speaks in our ears. Um, but I, I love Apple products. I, I really do. And I remember purchasing my MacBook Air. I opened the box, and I opened it, and I turned it on, and that Apple logo 
came at me with wonder, full of glory, and I was amazed. I would hold that thing like it was my precious. Every time I wanted to put it down, I'd always make sure that the surface uh, was clean. Never wanted it to be bumped, bruised. In fact, if you wanted to hold it, I would often tell my, my kids, no, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, have you washed your hands? Sanitizing has been a thing in our house long before COVID. But if you were to look at my MacBook Air today, that would not be the story. In fact, the space bar struggles because there's so much dust on the keyboard that I'm pretty sure there are things in there that will outlive us. I don't care anymore. It's got uh, bruises and dents and scratches. And, I mean, that's us. When we get something that we desire, something that has amazed us in this world, it's just a matter of time until the upgrade shows up. And now you move on to the next. And somehow, we want to treat Jesus that way. When I had my first encounter with Jesus, I was amazed. And then over time, it's just become, nah. And your life shows it. Your life shows it. Many of us wonder, why, why do I no longer bear fruit? As John 15 tells us, it's because you are no longer abiding to Jesus. Your eyes have left him. Mark wants us to see that Jesus is the servant king. That's who he is. He is no mere mortal. He is not just another prophet. He's not just another good teacher. He's not just another good man. He is the servant king who has come to take the sin of the world away. For all those who would trust in him are reconciled to the Father. He is our servant king. He heals all our diseases, casts out demons, calms the storms, forgives our sins. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. He saw Satan cast down like lightning, defeated death in the grave, carries the keys to prove it. His hair is now white like wool, white as snow, eyes blazing with fire, feet like glistening bronze. From his mouth comes a sharp sword to strike down the nations. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the entire host of heaven, dressed in white linen, is lined up for battle formation behind him, swords in hand, clanking shields, full of glory, victory inevitable. He is our servant king. And Mark wants us to see that. And so the question today is, will you believe? Will you believe? Will you put your faith in the servant king who is clothed in awe and wonder? Will your astonishment of him lead you to fall to your knees in worship? and reverence, and cause you to confess with your mouth that he is Lord. See, I believe that Mark's prayer is that it would. I believe that. As we come to the end of this book, his prayer is that it would lead us to that place where we would surrender it all because of the awe and wonder of Jesus. I believe his prayer is that we would do that now. Not tomorrow, not next week, not let me get my affairs in order first and then I'll be blown away by Jesus. No, he, he wants you to experience that now. He wants you to make that decision to surrender to this servant king now while that decision can be made freely and willingly. Because there is coming a time where you will see Jesus as the true servant king, but you won't be able to be on his side of victory because it'll be too late. When we see him coming through the clouds full of glory, it'll be too late if you have not surrendered to the servant king. 
Now, you might still be wondering, oh no, what about the rest of Mark chapter 16, verses 9 to 20? You spent so much time setting it up and telling us that it wasn't Mark and it is still the word of God, uh, but we've only been sitting in verse 8 and then you <laughs> made us go back to the beginning of Mark and walk through it. What about the rest of those verses? Maybe your question is, why was it added? Maybe the question is, how does it connect to the rest of Scripture? Maybe you're sitting there and you're going, who, who added it? Who was that brave individual that thought, you know what, Mark's not done, let me add. <laughs> I want to let you know that all of those are great questions. And, and I would encourage you to come back next week where we will dive deeper into that. We'll unpack it, we will. But for now, right now, my heart, my heart, much like Mark's heart, I believe, is to move certain individuals from unbelief to belief. Is to move you from unbelief to belief. And for those of you who do believe, it's to keep your eyes on Jesus. To keep your eyes on the wonder and the glory of Jesus. Now, it's a decision that you must make. No one can force you into it. It's a decision that you must make. And, and I know that it's not an easy one. I know that. I know it's not an easy one. Because there are so many things that are calling to the attention of our hearts. There are so many things that are saying that we can give you that, that sense of, of wonder and astonishment. The reality is that they can't. They can't. And, and so in many ways we sit in this tension of, okay, so what do I do? What do I do? Success and, and sex and, and accolades and, and, and acceptance and all these things are, are drawing me because they say if you get these things, then, then life will make sense. Then life will have meaning. And, and yet Jesus is sitting on the other side and saying, no, none of those things will satisfy. And so what am I to do? I, I want to believe, but I'm struggling. Or, or maybe you have crossed the line of faith and you are a Christian and you're going, I want to keep my eyes on Jesus, but, but man, the world that we currently live in, it's difficult. I'm struggling. My marriage is not where I want it to be. My financial reality is not where I want it to be. My depression is keeping me from, from fully experiencing the fullness of who God is by trusting him and his promises. And, and, so, and so I'm wrestling on it. I'm wrestling. It's not that easy. I want you to know that I can say with you I understand. Life is hard. Life is tough. And so maybe our prayer should be the words found in Mark chapter 9 verse 24. where we say, I believe, but Jesus, help my unbelief. I think many of us, we, we sometimes think that Jesus, Jesus is afraid of our doubt. He's not. We'll see next week that even his disciples doubted. It, it, it doesn't stop him from commissioning them. It doesn't, he doesn't go, oh, 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 some of you doubt it? Oh, I guess I'm left now powerless. I, 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 there's nothing I can do. He, he doesn't do that. A heart that says, I, I believe, but help my unbelief. Jesus uses. Jesus engages. Jesus meets. As we walk through the Gospels, we see so many people who have an encounter with Jesus, and they come to him, whether it's for healing, or they're demon-possessed, or they're wrestling with something, and then Jesus says to them, your faith has healed you. It doesn't say there that Jesus took out a measuring tape and went, oh, not enough faith. Can't help you. But rather they showed up to him because they were like, I believe, but I'm struggling. I've been bleeding for 12 years. I've been ignored. My loved one has died, had he not come sooner. He he's, hasn't walked for years, demon-possessed for years. But Jesus, I'm here. 
I want to believe, but help my unbelief. And so I'm going to end by praying for you, if that's you. On the one hand, I'm pleading for those who don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I'm pleading with you that you would surrender your life to the servant king. Full of glory. Awe and wonder. Be amazed by him. And then I want to pray for those who do believe but are struggling. To remind you that our Father who is seated on his throne and fully in control at the same time is close to each and every one of us. He knows your thoughts. He knows your pain. He knows your struggle. He knows your doubts. And so we come to him and we say, I believe. But help my unbelief. And so let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your faithful servants who wrote these words, not for their glory, not for their fame, but they wrote these words to tell us about your glory, to tell us that God, you love the world so much that you sent your son to come and live the life that we should have lived and die the death that we deserve. And that for all those who surrender to this servant king, we are given new life. We are reconciled to the Father. And so, Lord, I, I pray, I pray now for, for folks who are tuning in and listening to this, and, and, and they know, they know that they are not Christians. Maybe they've pretended for years. Maybe they grew up in a Christian home and just felt like, well, that's what we have to do. Lord, I pray that in this moment, Holy Spirit, you would take a hold of their hearts and bring them to a place where they would recognize that it's a decision that they make. It's a confession that they make. It's their hearts that need to bow before you. And so would you save them, Lord Jesus? And they may not understand what all of that means. My hope is that you would still meet them and engage them where they are. And that they too would be amazed they would be left in awe and wonder. They would be astonished that there would be a sense of trembling because they know that they are in the presence of the living God. And then, Lord, I pray for those who are hurting, those who have crossed the line of faith but are hurting, are in pain, are, are left wondering, God, where are you? We look to the heavens and we're like, where, where are you in my situation, in my circumstances, in my challenges? Father, I pray that they would know that just because you are silent, it does not mean that you are absent. Father, I pray that they would be able to find your heart, trace your hand, that they would see your fingerprints of grace throughout their lives. From the day that they came to salvation to this very moment. I believe. But Jesus, would you help my unbelief? So Lord, would you re renew our hearts? Take a hold of them and renew them. And give us that passion for your name. Holy Spirit, lead. We ask all of this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen.